Kelly Chow is a program manager with the Chief Seattle Club. We'll be talking about their programs and services, I guess we should say. Um, Travis Alley. So I'm going to introduce you now, and then we'll work on this. Can folks hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually. Um, and we're also joined on the panel by with Travis Alley, who's an assistant attorney general. And you, and you're in this area? Yeah. Yeah, in, in Seattle. Uh, and focuses on issues of veterans and military personnel, uh, born in the Northwest, uh, an alum cum laude from Seattle University Law School. And I'm going to kick it off. Uh, my name is Glenn Scott Davis, and I'm a program and policy specialist with the City of Seattle uh, Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. And uh, I, I think, did we agree on 10 minutes or 15 minutes? I, I remember 10. 10, okay. But I can talk really slow. I mean. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was told five, but I have, I have to share messages. So I guess we'll shoot for 10 and see what happens. Uh, uh, I just wanted to mention our office is a new, relatively new office in the city of Seattle. There's about 12 cities around the country that have offices like ours. We don't provide actual direct services, we're more of a funder and uh, organizer in a sense. And just briefly, our mission at the Immigrant Refugee, Immigrant Refugee Affairs Office is to promote and support immigrant integration as opposed to immigrant assimilation because we're working very closely with the city council, the mayor's office, and working with a variety of community organizations that represent various immigrant groups throughout the city. Um, so we have a number of different programs that we support, uh, ranging from helping people to become citizens, to become voters, and also to, be, to become civically active. Um, this is just an illustration of some of the programs we have a really cool website. I encourage folks to check it out, seattle.gov Immigrant Affairs. Uh, we recently conducted a study of the immigrant workforce, and I just want to mention this because this is the area of focus that I work on. So we see financial literacy as a really key component, and Alice's work and the work of the Financial Empowerment Network in Seattle is making a huge impact and difference in helping folks who otherwise, without that financial management, would be much less economically stable than they are. So we see this as really important. Uh, in many ways, a lot of the research that we did in the immigrant workforce, we were looking at Seattle and King County, are kind of obvious things that we all know anecdotally, but we were able to kind of go deep and really document uh, the degree of inequity that exists in the workforce and looked at how since the recession in, uh, a few years ago that pathways of mobility have really constricted in the workforce uh, and particularly for uh, immigrant and refugees but also for uh, native born people of color and also for low-income folks in general. And uh, one of the things that we found was that particularly in the Seattle metro area, but throughout the country, there really is what we would characterize as a shrinking uh, middle class. And the degree of income inequality that exists both in Seattle and throughout the country is a driver of uh, a lot of uh, problems and one of the main ones is that the growth of low-wage jobs has become so great that particularly for people that have language barriers and other barriers that uh, it's just much more difficult to have a pathway to social mobility. Uh, so what we looked at in our office was these type of challenges which as librarians I'm sure all of you confront all the time 
what we addressed in particular in the program I'm involved with is the last two bullets. That we looked at the existing ESL programs, we looked at the current employment programs and found that the outcomes for people with low levels of English proficiency was very poor compared to native born English speakers and also compared to folks that were uh, immigrants that were fluent. Uh, so we formed this program called Ready to Work. These are our partners, including the Seattle Public Library, as a very uh, close partner of us. Uh, and the program basically is a program that targets folks, and uh, uh, many of you I'm sure are familiar with the CASA system, this idea of categorizing people's language skills, level one to three, is significantly below proficiency for most jobs. Uh, so we created this program that helps people rapidly improve their English skills, but at the same time find employment all wrapped in one program. And you can tell I'm kind of playing to my audience because I put first thing there is everybody gets a library card. Uh, and uh, but we did it, this is a program strategy that integrates services. So right inside of our curriculum for folks, so people stay three months, six months, nine months, they get a job, they improve their English skills, they move on to college level ESL programs. But because of our case management, we're able to monitor their progress and track folks long term. And tying back to the financial literacy component, what we do is we do something that's very unique in these type of programs because nobody gets paid to do it, the federal state grants, is we track people's levels of economic stability over time. The program's been running two years, and we're looking at a five-year tracking of our participants so that we can demonstrate that this kind of model, which also includes integrating financial literacy, makes a big long-term difference in terms of folks' mobility and economic stability. Uh, so who are our participants uh, represent? Uh, so we've run the program now for two years with our community partners, the Asian Counseling and Referral Service and Literacy Source. And there's probably variations of these type of orgs in, uh, in many of your uh, communities. Uh, this just gives you a snapshot. We can email this to you, I guess, later uh, to get a sense of, of the variety of educational levels. Uh, and uh, it's, it's quite a mixed program. So we're being told by the colleges and by other training organizations in the workforce system that the performance is, is stellar, that we're really demonstrating something here. But our goal is to try to institutionalize this on a wider scale. So what we did is we uh, integrate, and this came from, uh, well, before we started the program, this came from um, uh, focus groups that we did with a variety of different immigrant organizations in the community talking to people and seeing what would really help folks. So right from the beginning, we introduce in the curriculum concepts and vocabulary related to finance and banking. We uh, have tours of, of credit unions and other basic services in the community. We refer uh, clients, depending where they live, to various services that are available through Seattle's Financial Empowerment Network. And we also have case managers who are trained in how to advise folks. And we also get referrals from the library and uh, so on. So we've integrated this into the curriculum. Uh, so these are some of the outcomes that uh, we've happened. We don't have yet a sophisticated way of measuring this, but we're, we did some surveys of students and show that integrating this in the curriculum really does uh, make a difference. And then as folks go on, we encourage them, replace them in services that they can, uh, they can get in the uh, community. But uh, I guess in conclusion, I'm on, am I at 10 minutes now? Okay, well, just one more minute. Uh, it, again, to emphasize the power of partnership and how important it is for, well, how appreciative we are. We, we accomplished something working with the Seattle Public Library, which may seem like a small thing, but we think it's huge. 
there's a library branch on uh, Rainier Beach. And the library has devoted dedicated space to our program, which I'm told is not a common occurrence to have a library to be able to do that. But because that branch library is so rooted in that community, it just really makes sense for both the library and us. And we think it's a great model. So if we could be of any help in your areas and wanting to connect with uh, providers and seeing how any support, just let us know. And, and uh, I guess we'll take the questions all together at the end. Does that make sense? Travis Allen. Thank you. Actually, I think, is this my time? Can you hear Excellent. Uh, so again, my name is Travis Allen with the Washington State Attorney General's Office. I just want to say thanks for the organizers for putting this on and providing me. I appreciate being here. Um, I, uh, excellent, thank you. Um, I was going to comment on the, I don't know if it's a jingle, I usually associate that with sort of singing in a commercial, but uh, <laughs> the jingle is sort of my financial experience is well, a real wake up call for me was actually right when I went to law school. Um, we, uh, I had to take out private loans. I moved across the country for my first year of law school. I had to take out private loans. And after I had taken out the loans, we get to law school, and somebody who was the, from that lending agency comes and talks to the entire class and is asks everyone, hey, who, uh, who negotiated their interest rate? And no hands go up. And she says, and this is the lender. You know, this is the person <laughs> representing the organization. It says, oh, you should, totally should have done that. And it's like, oh. Thanks. Uh, that was nice to uh, know earlier. Um, so I learned lots of things in law school and too many things about debt. Uh, so that's a uh, fun time. But uh, I'm going to talk about a few things. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the sort of our office generally and the resources we provide. We provide some um, specific resources, but also general resources. Talk a little bit about the population. So I'm here to talk about um, military service members, both current and former military service members, so veterans and people who are active duty or in reserves or National Guard. And then also just talk a little bit about some of the resources that are unique to that population. So um, before I sort of get started, uh, current and former military service members, from a general sense, um, have more debt and fewer assets than their civilian counterparts. This is just true. There are, lot, there are lots of reasons for that. And I could spend probably 10 minutes just trying to get into all that, so I'm not going to do that necessarily. But that is a, that's a reality that exists. Um, the population is often targeted because of their status. So you've probably seen affinity marketing. You know, there are companies that try to sort of serve that niche market. Um, and it's a unique population. Um, but uh, you know, as I get into sort of talking maybe about some of the resources that are available to that unique population, I think it's important to sort of as a caveat start out and say, the financial planning resources that are available to the general population, you know, a lot of those principles, a lot of the idea of how to make a budget and those sorts of things that are generally applicable are applicable to this population as well. And so even while there are unique resources and their status makes them uh, have things that are available to them that might not be available to other people, we shouldn't close this, this population off from the broader resources as well. We should think of their status and the things that's unique to them as sort of extra and above and beyond. And so those generally applicable principles. So all the resources you're talking about later, I know that there's folks um, you know, that are going to be talking about financial literacy. All that stuff applies to this population as well. Um, so a little bit about the office. And I won't go too much into this, obviously. But um, we do lots of different things. The AG's office does lots of different things. Um, uh, we, what we don't do uh, is uh, provide specific legal advice or representation to members of the public. That's not something we're allowed to do. So we get a lot of questions from people who are, you know, have legal questions. We can't always answer them outside of just providing general information. Um, but we do have a lot of consumer educational resources associated with the fact that we're the enforcer for the state's Consumer Protection Act. Um, and so we've got a lot of educational resources, and we also have a resource that's available to people at the Consumer Resource Center. Um, so our Consumer Protection Division, and there's an alum from our Consumer Protection Division here, who now is with the FTC, hi Sarah. Um, uh, so we take complaints, we take consumer complaints. So we've got a bunch of people who are there and they take written complaints. Um, we can take complaints over the phone, but they take written complaints. And what we do is we receive the complaint, 
um, and we send it along to the business that they're complaining about um, and ask the business to respond under our letterhead for the public record. We can't force the business to do anything, we can't compel them, but lots of businesses respond. Lots of businesses respond differently when our office sends a letter under our letterhead versus when they would if you know, it was just a consumer complaining on their own. And so this is a resource, again, that's available from a general standpoint. Um, the, the way to file a complaint is here in the uh, URL at the bottom. Examples of the top types of consumer complaints we get is uh, telecommunications, broadband providers, auto sales. Um, and some of these uh, are, again, hold true across the military and veteran population as well. So, for example, auto sales, auto financing issues are the number one cause of financial distress for current military service members. Um, and again, I'll get into this a little bit later, but you can imagine uh, it might be your first job, you're usually young, you've probably never gone through that process of buying a car before. Um, uh, you know, there are lots of car lots down and around the military installations, if you notice, um, and, and those people often will, will get excited and get into loans that they can't necessarily afford. Um, we, we, through this consumer complaint process, we take over 10,000 or 12,000 plus written complaints a year, and um, the amount of money that we're able to, through that process of forwarding the complaint and asking for a response to the public record, help consumers uh, recoup millions of dollars a year. So, um, uh, part of what I've been asked to do um, when I started the AG's office a few years ago was sort of try to focus uh, some of these office's efforts on this specific population to see you know, how can we do more to serve the new population of again, current former military service members. This is sort of the strategic framework um, that, uh, that we laid out, you know, try to reach out to the community, educate them, and force that. I only put that out there because, uh, again, it's part of the consumer education things that we do, um, and specific to the population, we put out this, which was a legal resource guide that talks a lot about the um, federal and state laws that are unique to this population. There are legal protections that um, uh, are legal, or legal protections that are unique to the population. So for example, um, you know, when someone is uh, getting ready to deploy or, or potentially change their station, there's a law called the Service Member Civil Relief Act that um, allows people to potentially reduce their interest rates on pre-existing loans. Or there's a Military Lending Act. Uh, a few years ago, there was a real concern about Military, uh, military members taking out payday loans and the really sort of uh, high interest rates that they were having to pay. And so you know, mil loans to military members are now capped at 36% as a result of, of federal law. So this talks about a lot of those laws. It doesn't talk about VA benefits necessarily, because if it did, it would probably be you know, uh, a little extra thick. Um, but this is available online. I brought a few copies. And um, I had some printer issues this morning, so I'll bring some more back and make this available in, in sort of a tangible form for you all. Um, but it, again, this is not necessarily, um, this talks about the legal issues, but a lot of times, you know, financial issues are legal issues. Uh, you know, when you sign a lease for your apartment that you're renting, right, you're entering into a contract, and that's a legal issue, that's also a financial issue. Those things are tied. Debt, credit, those are legal issues, you know, when you don't pay and get sued whatever it is. Um, I might be tipping my hand there about myself there. <laughs> um, so this is available from our office. Let me just check the time. So veterans and military service members in the state, this is, um, we are the sixth most populous state in the nation when it comes to this current service members and reservists in the National Guard. And they, those population centers tend to be focused around the military stations, and you can see that's in the lower left there. Fairchild, JBLM is the biggest, um, the uh, Naval Station, Kitsap, um, and, and a lot of those sort of satellite installations. Um, our veteran population in Washington State is shrinking, especially relative to the broader population because we were experiencing a population boom and also a lot of the uh, veterans from maybe Vietnam and Korea are aging out. Um, uh, but we still are the 12th most populous uh, state in the nation when it comes to veterans. So it's a, it's a significant proportion of the people uh, who live in Washington. Um, so the big takeaway in terms of when we're talking about um, resources that are unique to this population, again, 
I want to emphasize, you know, there are resources that are generally applicable and we shouldn't take that away from them. But when we're talking about resources that are unique, uh, you know, the, the, the type of resources that are available are usually determined by the time of service and the character of discharge. So I think we all have a sense of what a veteran is. Uh, under federal law, to qualify for benefits, there's a specific definition. I won't bore you with all the legal stuff. Under Washington state law, there are actually three different working definitions of the term veteran. And so our colloquial term for what, who is a veteran isn't necessarily uh, the same when it comes to sort of accessing benefits or accessing resources. Um, and I know that um, uh, you know, what you're going to be asked as librarians is you're going to be uh, you know, asked, hey, help. This is going to probably be beyond what you can do. So really referring people out to resources, knowing where to point them so that way they can access resources that may be unique to them that they didn't know about is the important thing. Um, so with that in mind, you know, current service members, I've just put a few here, there's lots of different resources. Um, but someone who's currently serving, uh, there are lots of resources available through the branch of their service. So usually there's a financial planner on base or multiple financial planners on base. I've had lots of opportunity to go talk with them. Um, it's usually available through the Mo Morale, Welfare, and Recreation Office. There's posts like that on every state. So there are financial advisors. There's legal assistance officers uh, through, through the branches of service. So for current service members, you know, a really great resource is said, well, if you get asked, is to say, have you checked in with the resources available on the installation or through the branch of service. For National Guard members and reservists, they're a little more diffuse. You know, the active duty folks who are on base, they're there day to day. You know, the National Guard folks, uh, you know, they have civilian jobs and civilian lives and they maybe check in one weekend a month or two weeks out of the summer or whatever it is. But there are still some resources available. Um, these sites are great in terms of financial education. You know, we have a lot of consumer education tips on like how to buy a car in our office, and the CFPB and the FTC has that as well. So, like military consumer has lots of good information. That's a project of the two of those agencies working together. Uh, military Saves is an effort that the Department of Defense does with local partners and regional partners. Uh, so these are really good resources to point folks to. And when I put them here under current service members, there's also resources usually in those contexts for veterans as well. It's just that um, they kind of have a ring when you look at a military consumer. Uh, someone who's a veteran isn't necessarily in the military anymore. Um, in terms of veteran resources, so people who are former service members, like I said, there's different definitions legally for what a veteran is. Um, to qualify for services from the VA, for example, you have to have a qualifying period of military service and discharge uh, other than discharge than, other than dishonorable conditions. And so, you know, if folks don't have a qualifying period of service or a discharge that um, doesn't qualify them, they can't access the VA benefits. Uh, we have a great uh, State Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, we, we act as that department's lawyer, so we work with them a lot. Um, and their job is, one of their main jobs is to help connect Washington veterans to the benefits and, and services that are available to them. And so they're a really good resource. Um, I forgot to put their number up here, but again, in that sort of legal resource guide, we work with the Department of Veterans Affairs to make sure that it was clear, here's how you contact the State Department. And this is a point of confusion sometimes. You know, some people get um, uh, sort of skeptical of you know the VA. Generally speaking, this State Department isn't the federal VA, and I've had to make that distinction for folks a number of times. Um, but there are lots of things that are available through the VA that can improve veterans' lives in terms of from financial stand standing point if they qualify. You know, disability compensation, education benefits, home loans. Uh, pensions, things like that. And so, again, you're not going to become experts in VA, how to get VA benefits, but there are experts available um, that can assist the veterans for free. Um, uh, it's illegal to charge for the initial, under federal law and state law, it's illegal to charge uh, veterans to assist them in the initial presentation of their benefit claim. And I think that's a big takeaway, too. So the State Department of Veterans Affairs provides this uh, resource for folks for free. Um, I talked a little bit about this already. Uh, you know, this population has some potential vulnerabilities. I put vulnerabilities in quotes because no one wants to say that people who, you know, have served uh, in uniform are uh, weak in some capacity. I don't want to try to get that uh, impression, but I think it was um, 
spacing on the name. You know, it was mentioned that um, financial, a good time to do financial planning is when you have maybe a life transition. Was that, was that fair? Cody. Mm -hmm. Cody, yeah, thank you. Um, well, this population has a lot more transitions than the general population. You know, they move a lot as a result of their service when they're in uniform. You know, they're usually in one place, maybe two to three years at most. They have to deploy overseas. They're separated from their family. Um, they're young. They've maybe never had a job before. Um, this type of job, by the way, is different than my job in the sense that the nature of it, I mean, it's more paternal in some respects while you're in service. A lot of things are provided so when people transition out, they may be doing, I, honestly, my brother served in the Air Force, he was, uh, and then went straight to school. He told me one time, he said, uh, can you help me do a resume? He was like 34 before he had ever had to do a resume in his life. Um, he's going to love that I mentioned that. <laughs> um, you know, and another thing, and this is true, and I'm going to wrap up, but this is true about, I think, government programs generally. So when we're talking about programs that are unique to veterans, I mean, these are federal programs or state benefits. Um, you know, there's lots of times there's confusion about the programs um, and misinformation that's out there. And anytime you have maybe sort of this opportunity where someone can say, hey, I know the secrets. I know the secret government program. I can help you get it. It's sort of a, a breeding ground for potential scams and things like that. Um, you know, the FTC put out this great thing about veterans' pensions. Um, we, it's an issue we've worked on as well. Um, where basically financial advisors who, um, and I'm not trying to say anything negative about financial advisors at all, but or insurance salesmen would, would go and um, maybe, you know, our concern was that they wouldn't share all the, um, all the consequences potentially in sort of the, the uh, restructuring assets to try to qualify for this benefit. Um, so, uh, and again, and, and they were doing so and trying to help people qualify for a benefit and, and receive a benefit when they weren't accredited from the VA. And as I mentioned that before, that's, that's illegal. So, um, other resources, just sort of generally, and I'll go through this really quick, that are there. This is something that Northwest Justice Project, which is sort of the largest mm -hmm. civil legal aid provider in the state, put out. Uh, it's called RepWaVets.org. Uh, Rep it really talks about some of the things to think about when you're talking to veterans, um, you know, how to how to interact with the population to some extent, some of the unique things. So if you're interested in learning more, this is a really great resource. Um, again, it's more legal focused, but uh, like I said before, that, that does have an implication of financial issues. Um, another resource that's out there, and again, this is linked through the stuff that we have, is there's free um, will planning for veterans in Washington State. They usually do maybe four or five events a year. Um, in different cities, usually one-time events. So you know, there's an event in Spokane that people can pre-register for. And I think they're starting to plan this. It usually happens in October, right before that. So folks are interested in that. Um, this is a means-tested thing, so you have to qualify. You can't have too many assets to qualify for this. So the, the lawyers who are doing this um, don't want to help people who can afford their services. Um, other resources I think are really important to mention is the Veterans Crisis Line. So this is I mean, suicide rates among veterans are a concern I think, for anyone. Um, this crisis line is a, a, you know, a resource that you can give to veterans who might be, you know, uh, I mean, you might hear a random off comment, you know, putting this out there and having this and knowing this is useful. Um, and the help for homeless veterans too, I put that in there, um, you know, because again, I know that um, you know, libraries are our communal source. And, you know, I work not too far from here, and I just wanted to say that there's, there's resources. And veterans are overrepresented in the homeless population. So I thought that would be important to include that. So with that, I will wrap up. And I'm sorry, I went a little bit over. <coughs> Hi, is this a good morning? Yes. I'm Colleen Chalmers. I am the program manager at Chief Seattle Club. Um, I am Lakota on my mother's side. It's a tribe from North and South Dakota. But I grew up on the West Coast, so I'm only in San Francisco and Seattle, big cities. Um, I've been at Chief Seattle Club for about a year and a half. Does anyone know Chief Seattle Club here? Just a couple? OK. Well, this is good. We like to share. Um, one thing, one statistic that we, we don't love to share because it's, it's unfortunate, but we, we like to share to educate, um, in Seattle or in King County rather, 
if you are Native American or Alaska Native or First Nations, it is you are at least seven times more likely to be homeless. And so just um, that, among many other factors, is why we exist. Um, our mission is to provide a safe and sacred, safe, safe and sacred space for urban Indians in Seattle, King County, to uh, rest and um, basically, we like to say, to renew the spirit of urban indigenous people. Um, we only serve adults, anyone over 18 years and over if they have a tribal ID can join. If they don't have a tribal ID, they simply just have to get mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or aunts and uncles, anyone to just sort of help um, show lineage. Most of our members do have tribal IDs, but there's you know various um, many institutional reasons why, why some people don't have tribal IDs. Um, so anyone over the age of 18, we do only serve Alaska Native and American Indian First Nations people. Um, we're one of the only nonprofits, I believe, in, in the country that does so. Many places primarily serve Native people, but they, they take um, they take anyone. And so all of our funding is actually private. Um, so that's just an overview of of that, um, I like to call us both sort of a day shelter and a community center. We are open now every single day from 7 to 2. We used to be only weekdays. Um, we, we basically started in 1970, just a quick history. 1970, we were just a little club room um, at the Lazarus Day Center over in Pioneer Square. We had two hours a day where our members could come and grab a sandwich. There was a tiny little art program. And it started as a really beautiful thing, but it was so small. Um, that was 1970. About 10 years ago, we got this beautiful building right next to the Lazarus Day Center. So we are on 2nd Avenue Ascension South, basically across from Smith Tower, if you all know where that is. Um, so for about 10 years, we've been in this building. And in August, it will be a year that we've been open on the weekends as well. So we are. Um, I guess slowly is the wrong word now. We're pretty rapidly um, trying to expand our resources. And it's now been about a month and a half that we've been open for lunch as well. So quickly, some of our basic services are just um, showers and laundry, um, hot meals. We, we used to only have breakfast. And we are really proud to now serve lunch. We used to just send our members out with a sandwich, which is certainly better than nothing, but um, two hot meals is really, really important. So we have, um, we do have medical as well. We have someone coming from Seattle and Health Board. Um, we have computers, we have clothing closets. So we have some of the basic services, you know, um, hygiene and, and medical and computers. We have cultural programming, we have you know, lots of, we have a legal clinic, which I'll get to. We, we serve about 100, we see about 100 members a day, on average. Um, right now, that it, the, our, our monthly average is, is much higher because of the weekends. We see about 500 a month, on average. Um, and we like to say, currently, we don't really have direct programs for financial literacy, but as, you know, just we've already we've, we've spoken about you know veterans and, and many people with legal problems, and as I'm sure as you can imagine, really any basic resources lend itself to financial literacy. So many of our members are most of our members are experiencing homelessness, and we acknowledge that that's they're in a, a pretty constant state of survival right now. So traditional Financial, financial literacy is not really the best fit for them in this given moment. We're happy to direct them in the right direction if they would like to do that. Many of our members are, are, are simply trying to survive. Um, so we like to say we don't directly do it, but we have many services, many partners, and many programs that lead them in the right direction to better their overall well-being which in turn can better their potentially housing situation, financial situation, even healthcare. 
um, you know, lends itself to financial literacy. So we have, just some of our partners, we have Department of Social and Health Services, so DSHS is with us every single day. Her name is Rosemary Martinez. For any of you who are, I, I don't know where many of you work, but if, for anyone who's here, really all of our members who come here know who Rosemary is, and you know, we have, um, we have the same woman coming from DSHS every single day, which is really helpful. So she's with us about 8.30 to 11.30, Monday through Friday. She can help them figure out food stamp issues. Um, mostly, it's, mostly it's food stamp issues, but there's, there's many other things too. She can help them get their, their Medicaid number, just things like that that, you know, we might not think about, but is a huge for our members. Um, so we have DSHS, we have the tribal liaison for the Division of Child Support comes to see us monthly. And he can also just come if any member needs to see them. Um, we have a veterans affairs specialist who comes monthly as well. And she, it reminded me to, to share this just based on some of what you were sharing. She is very big on, with her parameters, she can serve anyone who served one day. It doesn't matter their status. So that was pretty important for us to find someone who could serve our members that broadly. Um, in terms of our staff, we have a new case manager who we really hope will help with things like financial literacy. Um, just you know, having a case manager in and of itself can sort of help you um, just get some of your emergence, emergent situations in order. Our housing program, I like to really think, helps with financial literacy. Just with us paying for the smallest of things can help lower a barrier to housing and financial um, distress, I guess. You know, we'll, through many of our grants, one through you know, the King County, we can even help pay back dues on a storage unit. If that's the reason that they're homeless, you know, there's many things we can't do, and, and we do our best to sort of navigate that. But if, if something as small as a storage unit back fee is the reason that they can't get into their housing, we will do our best to fix that. So basically, we like to say, as, as much as we can, we will lower as many barriers as we can. Um, so that's, you know, whether it's paying for a housing application or the, or the storage unit, just um, really, I've been there a year and a half, and, and you can't even imagine sometimes the, the smallest or the largest things that will keep someone on the street. Um, especially, you know, in, in many large cities, it, it, we've all, um, we all, we talk about how poverty and homelessness sort of in and of itself is sort of a criminalized situation, and um, just people find themselves in the most dire or confusing situations. And so just all of these little things we like to, we like to say add up. So um, there's, we have lots of resources and I'm, I'm happy to share, share any of that. I have lots of cards I can, I can leave over there. Is there more time or? Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment. Um, I'm from Ballard Library, and we have, I think, I don't know if it's someone from Veteran Affairs who comes and tables in our lobby, and that's been amazing because they, you know, it's like before they even get to the library, they're in the lobby and um, talking to veterans about benefits. And I don't know if that's your office? Not our office. Not your office, but anyway. So, yeah, so uh, again, a lot of times, you know, there's county, no, I don't want to get too but it's either someone from the state, probably, or it could be someone from potentially as well. Yeah. Um, here in King County, they've got to look at the resources. Maybe that is King County. Yeah, because yeah, they contacted us and it's really successful. I mean, it's a, like, how did it, I kept thinking as I heard all this information, it's like, I have access to information, but how would just somebody, if they're homeless and living in the park right now across the street, how would they get to all that stuff? So I just love the fact that we have, you know, we can use the libraries to bring other, you know, specialists. Yeah, and well, this might seem like pandering, but, uh, Libraries are sort of the communal mode of oh, totally. how people access information, right? right? right. Um, I spent a fair amount of time in libraries as yeah. you know, through school, and yeah. I love them. And, um, but, but I think to the point that was just being made, you know, someone who is struggling to survive, right. who is really just 
research all of their brain power is being dealt with, uh, you know, how do I find my next meal or where am I going to sleep tonight? You know, they don't have the same capacity to to find those resources exactly. or to take the time to dig them up. And um, people are a good way to convey it rather than, I mean, they can come in and talk to us, but at least people just put it right out there. Yeah. Word of mouth research. Yeah, it's, it's a commercial idea that is wonderful. What kind of jobs were uh, the participants in your uh, program getting? <laughs> for, for most of the folks that are in the program are getting mostly the type of jobs that folks with lower levels of proficiency get. Uh, hotel industry, hotel, restaurant. Uh, but what we've done is trained our job placement counselors in targeting employers who offer what we characterize as quality jobs. Not all hotel jobs are equal because not all hotel managements are equal. Some are more committed to uh, worker rights and committed to a positive work environment. For example, getting an entry-level janitorial job at downtown emergency medical services or at the University of Washington uh, are much more significant economically stable jobs than the counterpart jobs in other employers. So part of our emphasis is on engaging with employers. It's really part of the city's commitment to labor standards in general. We focus on minimum wage, we focus on paid sick leave, things like fair scheduling. But another component of that is supporting those employers who really do make an effort to uh, provide things like on-site financial counseling is a perfect example. Uh, and the, these kind of interventions that we're talking about can actually make the difference, even given people's income and what social class they are, and what happens to their children in the next generation. Um, so the, the big challenge we find at the city is the lack of integrated services. And what we've tried to do in as many models as we can is leverage the power of government to persuade, cajole, and maybe a little bit demand that agencies really work together and that we look at changing policies and funding structures that literally force providers to provide integrated services. Because the hardest thing is when people lack social capital, how do I move from one area to another? And the libraries, like you said, are a real hub of this. But we're working hard on this issue of changing policies, changing funding structures to dismantle. We talk about barriers for special populations, maybe one of the biggest barriers are the very institutions that are supposed to serve folks. When we look at the barriers at the colleges, barriers in the workforce system, barriers in social service agencies, a lot of well-intended work doesn't have a multiplier effect because of the silos. So until government uh, finds a way, I think, of really doing that, it, we're not going to have as much of an impact as we otherwise could. Well, the, you mean the, the, the ready to work program? Yeah, you talked about the and the ESL on three. Right, so, so what we're doing is we're finding that because of the learning model we use and w w that really focuses on what we call state-of-the-art adult ed learning thing. It's a very motivational model. So we're finding that a significant number of the participants in this program then go on to the next level of ESL. Uh, and about half of the people that are being placed in jobs in this program are also continuing their studies. So it kind of belies the notion that, well, it's just too hard to work and go to school. 
But when motivation is there and people experience success as learners and make gains, there's a real motivation. But that's where the intensive case management comes in. And intensive case management is very expensive. Uh, but the city of Seattle has made commitments of its own dollars to supplement what the colleges and workforce system are doing. So the classes themselves to the colleges? Or the well, the, our classes are held in the community. One is at the library, the Rainier Beach Library. Another is at uh, a literacy source in North Seattle. Because we find the accessibility is easier for people at those beginning stages of English language. To access something in their own neighborhood or community makes a huge difference. And then they kind of build the muscle to be able to navigate. I mean, for native-born speakers, navigating bureaucracies is maddening, right? Uh, I remember when I was in college trying to register for class or whatever. So that's part of what people need to learn is how to weave those networks. Facebook is updated much more than our website. <laughs> so, uh, I, you're, feel free to, in, to see our, our website, but currently, if you want to see what's going on, our, our Facebook is pretty often updated. To learn more. Cool. Or you're, you're all welcome to come visit as well. We love to tours. Do we have time for a quick question? Yeah. I, I have a question for you, uh, as a fellow panelist. What, what, what would you see as and I, uh, one of the reasons I ask this is being part of the city. It's not something that's talked about enough is the community that you serve. And what you see as being the, 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 maybe the single greatest institutional barriers that, that would help make, if they were overcome, would help make your services more impactful. I don't know if I'm the best person to answer, but I, 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 some thoughts are just institutional barriers. Um, Seattle doesn't love to talk about race, but um, Seattle has many racist institutions. Um, I, I briefly mentioned just you know how homelessness and poverty in and of itself is sort of criminalized. Um, so I guess that is the big umbrella term of, of what could be changed. Um, but on a, on a smaller scale, I wish I remembered the name of it. Um, there was a couple days ago at City Hall, there was a hearing that I didn't get to go to. We didn't know about it in time. Um, but basically, it was to try to change the laws on housing applications, looking into warrants and past arrests, and just little things like that. Um, I think that if that can affect, of course, veterans and immigrants as well. It affects many different people on several different levels, but especially communities of color and, and the Native community in Seattle. There's many, many things on someone's record that maybe is is not true, maybe is is less dire than is on paper. There's several different reasons why um, someone is being kept from housing. And it's, it's not just drugs, and it's not just money. Um, it's not just what happens to people when they're homeless. That's a huge part of it. But it is um, pretty racist laws and regulations. And I, I don't know necessarily how we change that right now, but there's ways to, to get there. And I think City Hall is a, a good place to start. Um, Supporting Chief Seattle Club and supporting places that, that do work like we do. You know, we're not the only ones. There's so much in the city. Before I worked at Chief Seattle Club, I didn't know about all the resources for urban Native people, and there's so much. We're really proud of what we do, and we love our members, and, and we really love who we are, but there's so many other places as well um, to support and to get to know. So if anyone wants more resources or questions, you're all welcome to email me or call. One of those barriers in for subsidized housing 
is bad credit, which really relates to this financial empowerment. A very hardworking person could be working two jobs, desperately needing subsidized housing, which makes a difference in a few hundred dollars of rent a month, and they can't qualify because they have easily fixable things on their credit history. So when you talk about the impact of the kind of services we're talking about today, they could be huge.